Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, I interview Jerry Downs. Now, Jerry served 25 years with the FBI and had a very unique career. He spent 11 of those years in the Child Abduction and Serial Killer Unit, also known as the CASKU. You know in the FBI how much we love our acronyms. The name of that unit was changed to the National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime, or the NCAVC, and is now known as the Behavioral Analysis Unit, the BAU. That's the unit we have all come to know and love because of criminal minds. So uh, Jerry was in that unit for 11 years, and then the last three years of his career, he was in a one-man sub-office in Vancouver out of the legal attache office in Ottawa, Canada. So Jerry has lots of cases that he could review with us, but he chose a fascinating one. It is about, or should I say a boot, because he was in Canada, a serial killer in Ghana. So they had a serial killer who had killed, murdered, mutilated over 30 women. They were unable to identify who the killer was, and Ghana requested the FBI's assistance. So 10 agents went over to Ghana in 2001 and in two weeks were able to identify the killer, assist with the arrest, and get a confession from him. It's a fascinating case and uh, I can't wait for you to, to hear it. Before we do that, I just have a few things I wanted to say. First of all, I got a great review on iTunes from Technocratica. And Technocratica, thank you. Yes, I know I've had some issues with audio, so I have some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is that I have finally figured out why my microphone was not working with Skype. And it has all been corrected. The bad news is I didn't figure it out until after I had recorded this interview. So yes, Jerry Downs sounds great, but Jerry Williams sounds like she is talking underwater. So I apologize for that, but I believe that I can promise you that in the future, the audio for both my guest and for me will be better. The other thing that I wanted to mention to you real quick is that after several weeks of being on iTunes new and noteworthy right out there in front. I'm so blessed, so grateful that they chose FBI retired case file review to promote. But after several weeks, my turn on the pedestal is over. Nothing's wrong. Just new podcast coming out and iTunes rightly wants to give everybody a chance to be promoted under new and noteworthy. So, Now it is my turn to make sure that people know about the podcast, and I'd like to ask for your help. If you're enjoying the podcast, please share it with everyone. Let them know, you know, that they can find me on iTunes or Stitchers, or they can just go to my website, jerrywilliams.com, in order to listen to the episodes. I can make it easy for you. Every Saturday, I tweet at jerrywilliams1 on Twitter. I also post at Jerry Williams author, my Facebook page. And I also share the episodes on LinkedIn. So if you're listening to this and you're enjoying it, please retweet or share. I would really appreciate it. And now here's the show. Everyone, I am very excited to introduce my guest for today. It's Jerry Downs. Hi, Jerry. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Now, I know a little bit about your career, and it is so varied. You have done and have been assigned to just about anything and everywhere. But before we find out a little bit more about you, could you just give me a little tease about the case that we're going to be talking about later? Sure. We uh, we were called uh, back in 2001 to go to Ghana, Africa, um, 
on a serial murder case where 30 women were murdered over uh, the past uh, three or four years. And uh, the president of Ghana uh, met with uh, Director Louis Free in April of 2001 uh, and told uh, Mr. Free about the uh, the homicides. And uh, Louis Free's response was, I'll have somebody here in 10 days. So the next thing, our phone was ringing. I was in uh, what was known then as a child abduction serial killer unit at Quantico. And uh, we headed to Ghana. Wow. So that's going to be exciting to, to hear about. But tell me a little bit about you, all of the different assignments that you had during your career. All right. Well, I started as a uh, deputy sheriff, actually, up in uh, northeast Pennsylvania in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> while I was going to college at the University of Scranton. And then uh, after uh, two years with the Sheriff's Department, I went to the Honesdale Police Department, 12-man police department, where you ended up uh, working whatever happened on your shift. Did two years with them, went to the Pennsylvania State Police, was a trooper in Belmont Avenue in Philly, and then went up to uh, Honesdale. And uh, after four years, the Bureau called. So I went with the FBI, wound up first off as in a two-man uh, resident agency in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, from there, I went to Boston headquarters, worked the bank robbery task force, was the liaison to uh, the airport, Logan Airport, and had a chance to go out to the RA in Springfield, Massachusetts in 91, which I did. Uh, ended up with a kidnapping case out there that turned into a child serial killer. And we got the guy, a guy named Louis Lent, and prosecuted him successfully. And just as that was winding down, Louis Free created a unit called the Child Abduction Serial Killer Unit in Quantico. So uh, I raised my hand for that, was selected, and spent the next 12 years at Quantico working uh, all kinds of child abduction and serial murder cases. Uh, I got traveling quite a bit on that case, and uh, to the point where uh, after a while I was on the road three weeks out of the month, so my wife said, uh, you, you, you ought to find something else to do. So I put my name in a hat to be uh, the uh, league ad in Vancouver, Canada. I was selected, and that's how I finished up my career. I was a one-man office in Western Canada, based in Vancouver. I covered uh, British Columbia, Alberta, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territory. It was a great way to go out. So I've, uh, I've had a lot of fun, and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Well, I'm wondering, though, once you got to be a uh, league ad in uh, Vancouver, I would imagine you're still doing a lot of traveling. Uh, not quite as much, but uh, I was, yeah. It was, uh, it's a huge territory, so uh, I was on the road uh, maybe one week out of the month up there, which was a big improvement over three weeks out of the month. But uh, most of the stuff I could handle from the, my Vancouver office, but... Uh, it was strictly a liaison post where if uh, we needed police assistance, I would meet with the police officers up there, tell them what they needed, uh, what we needed. And if they needed something in the States, they would come to me and we would uh, get it done for them in the States and uh, let them know how that turned out. You know, it's a great opportunity to uh, show a very needed um, aspect of uh, international investigation. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yep. So mentioning international investigations. Tell me a little bit more about this Ghana murder case. Okay, well, in uh, like I said, in April of 2001, Louis Free was traveling around the uh, country, the various African countries. And uh, at one point he was in Ghana, met with the president of Ghana, and uh, the president requested assistance. Louis responded with that he would. And next thing we knew, uh, there were six of us sent to Ghana. They sent uh, four from uh, our unit, uh, the Critical Incident Response Group's uh, Child Abduction Serial Killer Unit, and two from the Washington Field Office, two evidence uh, response team members. Uh, and I'm sorry, and I forgot the polygrapher. We sent a polygrapher from uh, Atlanta Division. Now, what was the what was the Ghana police force like at this time that they needed this assistance from the FBI? The Ghana police was a national police agency uh, who were extremely uh, willing to work, wanting to work, but unfortunately had never really received any type of training. So we went over to. Uh, Ghana, and that was the first thing. We met with them, and they had all these unsolved homicides. They had no idea. Uh, it was obvious there was no investigation conducted. So the first thing we did was kind of set up a uh, a class, uh, 
classroom setting. Uh, we put a map of the city up. We asked for a map of the city uh, where these homicides were, and we tried to explain the concept of a pin map. So we got got the thumbtacks, uh, got the map up, and uh, I asked uh, the lead investigator where the first case was. So he pointed to it. I said, well, put a pin there, which he did. I asked where the second one was. Uh, he pointed, so I said, put a pin there. He took the first pin out and moved it. I mean, that's what we were dealing with. Uh, it was, uh, so once we got the pin map established, we actually went out and we looked at the neighborhoods and we knocked on doors, something they had no idea about doing a neighborhood canvas. And after the first four cases, the same name came up. Uh, a guy named Charles Kwanza was in each of those neighborhoods and was last seen with the victims, something the police had never found out. Now, another issue that uh, we had to deal with was the lack of physical evidence. When these women were murdered, and this is over a three-year period prior to our arrival, there was uh, what, what the, uh, the response was, was the uh, people, the police would come, cordon off the body, and have the village walk past it until somebody identified who the victim was. They would just take her up then and bury her in the clothes she was uh, murdered in, and that was it. No wow. the concept of physical evidence. So we try to explain physical evidence to them, and uh, you know it was a it was a process. It was a long, drawn out thing, uh, but uh, and why why was it? I'm trying to understand why um, a country like Ghana would not have a trained police force that had these skills. Uh, you know, that's a very good question. I, I can't answer that, but. Uh, I mean, they had a uniform division that had nice uniforms and they were out directing traffic and things like that. And it was very, uh, they were very competent that way. But when it came to investigations and uh, all, all things connected to investigations, they were just extremely lacking. They, they had no uh, no training, no formal training. Uh, they had, uh, you know, maybe a camera one camera, but uh, no film, things like that. It was just there was no money. Um, when, uh, what about their What about their court system? Because I'm sure there had to be some cases that they had to bring to court. Yes, uh, and, and their court system, again, we were blazing new territory with this because uh, we did a lot of things that had never been done in Ghana before. When, uh, when the subject uh, was identified, we brought them in. We gave them a polygraph. They had never done a polygraph examination in Ghana and we had to do it in his nat uh his native dialect language so they had to use an interpreter which caused problems uh one of the laws one of the rules in Ghana is that anytime you have a suspect in custody you have to get a witness to come in a, a person from the public to observe and so as when Kwanzaa was brought in and sat down, somebody went out into the middle of traffic. One of the police officers stopped the guy driving him home from work or whatever, brought him inside. And he was in the police station for the next two days uh, observing. That, so that's how they selected their yeah, yeah. witness. It's just uh, it's totally uh, different than uh, what we're used to. That's how it was when you got That's there. That's how it was when we got there. Right. That's what I'm saying. So we, right. we, we try to set up the training uh, even before we brought the suspect in and uh, and got the case uh, moving forward. We did a lot of training. We talked to them about physical evidence, and they did have uh, a little bit of physical evidence, including a T-shirt with some blood on it that was brought in from the last homicide, which had occurred maybe a week or two before we arrived. Uh, this girl uh, came in and said that uh, she thought her boyfriend might be responsible because he was out the night the, the, this last girl disappeared. And when he came home, he had a T-shirt and it looked like blood on it. So she brought the shirt and that was hanging in a closet when we got there. Not wrapped up Nothing. in any way. So that was one of the first things we did. Was uh, and there was a couple of other items as well that she brought in. So we separated it, and we had our evidence folks show them how to wrap evidence, how to handle it. And every time we handle a different piece of ev evidence, we change our gloves, you know, so we don't cross contaminate it. And I'll never forget the one captain from the police department was standing next to me, and after they threw out about their fourth pair of gloves, 
the captain looked at me and says, why do they throw glo- the gloves away? So I tried to explain the cross-contamination to him. He reached in his pocket. He had an old pair of uh, cotton gloves that used to be white. And he said, I've had these for eight years. I said, well, throw them away. We're going to give you a lot of gloves. But I, wow. I mean, that's, that was just the uh, the mindset. Anyway, uh, we uh, we did the training, and then we went out, and we started knocking on doors in the neighborhoods. And within the first four cases, the same individual's name came up, Charles Kwanzaa. Uh, we brought Kwanzaa into the police station, and they had no idea of how to do an interview or an interrogation. Uh, what usually happened prior to our arrival was somebody was accused of something, and uh, they would be uh, manhandled until uh, they confessed to it. So uh, this was a whole new thing for them. They were it, it was amazing to watch these officers. They were like sponges. They just took in everything you said, everything you did. They were writing down notes. I mean, they wanted to learn, and they just had never had the opportunity before. But we uh, we explained to them that we were going to come up with different themes for the interview. Uh, you know, um, typical uh, basic interview interrogation uh, techniques and throw out themes. Uh, you know, the girls came on to you, uh, th- whatever it was, and throw them out, keep throwing themes out there until he grabbed a hold of one. And it wasn't long to, before he made the comment that the uh, the spirits made him do it. It's, mm. it's like, okay, we'll take that, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway. If that's the theme of choice, yeah, then okay. Yeah, we'll take okay. it. Uh, so over the next two days, uh, Bob Melnick, the uh, polygrapher from Atlanta, and an interpreter uh, did most of the interviewing, and he ended up getting nine confessions. Confessions to nine homicides. Um, after that, we we felt that uh, you know the Ghana police should basically be involved in arrest, and we they identified who they thought would be their best interviewers, and they sat down and we did a you know two hour interview interrogation class with them, telling them uh, you know try to be nice to the guy. Uh, empathize with them, even though it, you know it's it's totally against your nature. Don't yell at him. Don't uh, get in his face or anything. And uh, and they did. And they followed the instructions. And they got thirty confessions over. You know, he confessed the, the rest of the cases to the Ghana police. Wow. So he was charged. And uh, one of the things that uh, was a selling point to him was that. Uh, Early on, they told him, uh, Charles, you're going to be famous. You're going to be Ghana's first serial killer. And he lit up like a Christmas tree. You know, he thought that was great. So, but uh, just, uh, it was very interesting. And he had all the details. I mean, we managed to get details from each of the cases that uh, were not public. Uh, There's very little public anyway in the country of Ghana. Uh, just that the women had been killed, but uh, we had. Could you could you take us through a couple of the scenarios of how he um, was able to, to to get to his victims? Yeah, he uh, he would be. Uh, several of the victims were prostitutes, and several of them were street people. Um, but he would he was a, he was a young, good-looking kid. He was probably twenty eight, twenty nine years old. And, uh, you know, he would see them uh, as vulnerable people. Uh, what we found over the years is a lot of these serial killers, they're, uh, they're like, uh, like wild animals. And, and you can equate them to wild animals. They look for the stragglers of the herd. And a guy like him who was a uh, bona fide serial killer, I mean, he would look for these women that had issues, that had problems, and uh, be nice to them. And they responded in time and go with him. We would go anywhere. And it's not like he, he took them anywhere. He took them into the woods. Most of the bodies were found just alongside the road. Um, as I said, there was no physical evidence uh, recovered because uh, they didn't know how to do that. But I'm sure had uh, had these happened in the United States, he'd have been caught on his first or second case because it's, it's not like he was a mastermind or anything or was concerned about physical evidence. And how did he kill them? He strangled most of them. And uh, there was a couple of them I think were stabbed. But uh, again, uh, 
they were all sexually assaulted. They were left uh, in ways that uh, would see, you know, degrade the women where they were posed, they were naked. And again, one of the things we were concerned about going over there was the culture. We didn't know if our way of investigating serial murder in the United States was going to be applicable in a country with a totally different culture, but it was. We saw the same things there that we see everywhere else. So uh, he would, uh, like I said, uh, go out at night. Most of these occurred at night uh, in the city of Accra, which is the capital city. And uh, he would meet up the women with the women, uh, have sex with them, murder them, and go home. And sometimes he was living with a girl, sometimes he wasn't. Uh, he never seemed to bother the women that he uh, he lived with. Um, but uh, most of them were afraid of him. They uh, they wouldn't cross him. He ended up being charged with the with the thirty counts. He was convicted. Now the one good thing we did have was they they had a good photographer there, and they they got a lot of good crime scene photographs. So that okay. was something that we did have to work with. Uh, now, did you go back and exhume the bodies and, and try to get any type of physical evidence? Um, we we did on a couple of them. A few of the bodies were actually, like I said, this was going on right up until the time we got there. A few of the bodies were at the morgue. We're still at the morgue, and that was just another uh, experience, uh, to say the least. We went over there to uh, to see if we could help out with that. And we get to the hospital, and now you're in the country of uh, sub-Sahara Africa, you know. Hot. Uh, hot. <laughs> and there's, Steamy. Yeah, there's, there's no windows on the hospital rooms. There's no screens on the hospital rooms. There's bugs and insects all over the place. And then you go to the morgue, and there's no refrigeration. I mean, you just couldn't stand the smell. Oh. Wow. Oh, it was just awful. So uh, needless to say, we didn't spend a whole lot of time there. But it was, uh, you know, and there, there wasn't that much. But what we did get on that one shirt was the last victim's blood and uh, and Kwanzaa's DNA. Uh, we sent everything we that we did collect to the FBI lab. It got priority uh, handling because uh, of Louis Free. And, uh, you know, w we made a solid case. He was ultimately convicted of all 30 cases and sentenced to be hung. They still hang people in, in Ghana. Uh, they haven't carried out the execution yet because now they're looking at him for homicides uh, that had happened 10 years earlier in a different city where he lived there. So it's uh, pretty unusual. He lived in a city. Ten women are dead. He left the city, and nobody got murdered after that. Wow. So definitely, I, I, I wonder why he confessed to 30 murders um, in this one city and, and not the 10 where he was previously. I mean, it's not like adding 10 more is going to get him in more trouble. No, that's true. And at the time, we didn't know about those when we were there. And I think since then, his uh, his relationship with the Ghana police is, uh, has deteriorated quite a bit because now, you know, he finally realized he got convicted. He's going to be hung. So he's not uh, all that willing to talk now. Yeah, the, the fact of being a notorious serial killer is not as exciting when no. uh, you realize that you're going to be a, a dead notorious serial killer. And that's exactly right. But, it, uh, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of uh, – we were out in the, in the bush of Africa on several of the cases where uh, some of the bodies were found. And, uh, I mean, it, Accra is the capital city, but, uh, you know, you go a mile out of town and uh, you're in the middle of nowhere. And uh, uh, I'll never forget one day, uh, the, one of the agents that was with us is Wayne Lord. I don't know if you've ever met Wayne. He was, uh, he was known as the bug man at the academy. He had a Ph.D. in uh, zoology and entomology. And, uh, but he was one of the agents in our unit at the time. But he was a great guy to take on a case like, the, like this because he knew the bugs. I mean, he would study uh, the bugs uh, for time of death, things like that. But he also knew uh, what animals were were where and uh, we pulled up at one scene and it was up in a field and uh, the police got out and they said oh she's body's found right up there and i start getting out of the car and he grabs my arm he says we're not going up there i said why not he says spitting cobras up there I said, okay talk me out of it <laughs> <laughs> so but uh 
it was uh, it was quite an experience. But the thing that we didn't realize when it was uh, uh, all said and done, we were at the uh, hotel. We were staying in uh, a pretty nice hotel in Accra, um, and at seven o'clock. I think it was the morning we were getting ready to leave or the, the day before that. 7 a.m., somebody's banging on my door. So I open the door and it's one of the police officers. And he says, the president wants to see you. I said, what are you talking about? He says, the president wants to see you at the palace. And I'm thinking, and sure enough, what we didn't know was when the the, the president that met with Louis Free, he had just been elected um, earlier that year. And his uh, plat one of his platform was that he was going to get the serial case, uh, serial murder case resolved in Accra. So we made him look like a champ. Oh my yes. And, uh, anyway, he uh, he summoned all of us to the uh, what they call the castle or seat of government, and uh, we went over there at like ten in the morning, and uh, the president who uh, was like seven feet tall, he's a huge huge guy. And uh, his entire cabinet met with us, and they wanted to have a state dinner for us. And we had the uh, the ambassador there and everything else, naturally. And, uh, you know, all, we had been there for like two weeks. And, again, you have to be very careful what you eat and everything else. So we really wanted to get going and get, get a decent meal. Um, but... Uh, we we told him we had a. It was the day we were leaving. Is when it was. We told him we had to leave oh. that night at seven a seven p.m. So he had a big ceremony for us that afternoon. And gave us all gifts to take back. And I've got a uh, statue of a Ghanaian uh, woman that he got uh, bronze statue. Other people got uh, pictures and plaques and. Uh, we hung out with the uh, president for like two hours. And I remember this is in. Uh, May of 2001. And I said to him, Mr. President, any chance uh, you'll be coming to the United States? He says, yes, I have to come in September to see Mr. Bush. September? Yeah, 9-11. I said to him, uh, I said, oh, well, that would be nice. I said, uh, I only live about 40 miles south of Washington. Uh, love to have you in the uh, your uh, group over for a barbecue. And he says, Oh, I like that very much. So I called my wife later. I said, Hey, guess who's coming to dinner? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so did it happen? No, or was that... 11 happened and he never, okay. he didn't make the trip, but, uh, he did come, uh, I think a year or so later, uh, following up on that though, uh, they wanted us to come back and, and provide training to the Ghana police. So we were supposed to go back later in 2001 and then everything happened. So we never got back there until 2003. And uh, uh, four of us that went uh, on the original trip went back over and we spent two weeks, I think, uh, basically training the, uh, the Ghana National Police Force uh, investigators on all kinds. So this is almost like a, a mini national academy for the whole. It was, yeah, for the whole, the yeah, and there was there was probably eighty to a hundred uh, investigators involved in this thing, and uh, but again, like sponges, they uh, I'll never forget the first morning. And now we're at the same hotel, this five star hotel that we stayed at. One of the problems in Ghana is the power grid; the power goes down. So we've got you know PowerPoint presentations and all kinds of stuff like that, and then you'd be in the middle of it in the power goes off and it's like okay you gotta stand up here and wing it and uh unfortunately our humor doesn't always go across that well with them but uh the first morning at 7 a.m we're down there getting set up and there were, half of the class was filled up already i'll never forget people dressed to the nines i mean one guy came in wearing a tuxedo <laughs> and, you know and we're dressed down we're wearing cargo pants and polo shirts a tuxedo to FBI police training. Yeah, yeah, but I. Well, that that I mean, we joke, but that just shows you the respect that's, that, that's, that they have. That's exactly right. But I mean, the two weeks you you you're up there and you're thinking to yourself, is any of this getting across? And after the uh, the last day of class, um, one of the captains was sitting in the first row the whole two weeks. I mean, and he basically got up to thank us and regurgitated every one of our lectures from the previous two weeks. It was amazing. And he said, and Jerry said, and Wayne said, and Kirk said, and it was, uh, they, they, they got everything that we put down. 
when we put right. it out there. So uh, we we got their uh, captain, who later became their chief, uh, into the National Academy. He's still a good friend. I still hear from him on email on that. Uh, and then uh, two other folks got into the National Academy. And then I kind of lost touch because I ended up going to Vancouver and that. But in 2007, I get a call. I'm in Vancouver. And the uh, National Academy unit at Quantico calls me up and uh, basically said uh, they were having the uh, NA retrainer in Accra, Ghana. And my first response is, you're kidding. They said, no, no, we're going to have it there. It's one of the most. Could you, could you explain to the listeners what the NA is? The National Academy is a, uh, it's a uh, training course that the FBI puts on uh, three or four times a year. I think it's an 11 week co- course where all of uh, it's open to police officers from around the world. And it's uh, advanced training and police management techniques and uh, uh, geared towards the higher level uh, ranks of police agencies throughout the United States. It's a very prestigious organization. uh, And when the uh, police officers complete it, they become members of the National Academy Association. And they can call on each other if they need something in Japan. You call a Japanese officer that's been uh, to the National Academy and it gets done. Uh, if you need something, uh, you know, in Oklahoma and you're in New York, uh, same thing. So it's a uh, it's a great group, and uh, and this National Academy takes place uh, at the FBI Academy in Quantico. That's right. But I guess you're saying that they also have refreshers around the world through. Uh, yeah, they have uh, they have associations, and uh, like the uh, the North American group is Canada. And uh, and the United States and they have Central America, Mexico and the uh, Central American countries, Europe, Africa, the Middle East. Uh, each region has a uh, a National Academy group, so they'll have uh, training courses uh, every year in uh, in all of the groups. Uh, the European course is always very popular because people want to go to Europe. Uh, maybe not now so much, but uh, for years it was. But anyway. Uh, the uh, African and Middle Eastern group uh, in 2007 met in Accra, Ghana. So anyway, they called me and uh, they wanted to know if I would come over and talk about their case. And so I'm in Vancouver. It was a 17-hour flight from Vancouver to Accra, Ghana. But I, uh, we did it, and uh, it was great. It was uh, just an amazing thing to see how uh, how they had developed into uh, a good police agency. And I think it all started with this case. And uh, it was something that, uh, you know, you're very proud to uh, be a part of. I can imagine. Now, how often does that happen? I mean, uh, the Ghana president talks to Louis Free and you uh, go there and train the organization. Is that something that is available or offered often or was this a once in a lifetime um no program? no i mean uh, our unit at quantico was uh was called many times uh, to assist uh i mean we have to be invited in by the, uh, the government of the country um but uh i, I went to italy i went to uh, germany i've been uh to Colum- uh to uh, chile on cases, and it's because uh, they're difficult cases. Just like in the United States, our unit was never called in on routine cases. Uh, um, we would, and what was the name of the unit again? It was. It started out as the Child Abduction Serial Killer Unit, and then it ultimately was uh, wrapped up into the Behavioral Analysis Unit, which is the uh, unit on criminal minds right now. But uh, oh. it's like I, I tell everybody, I said, uh, you like criminal minds? And they say, yeah. I said, well, none of it's accurate. <laughs> we don't. We didn't have a Learjet, you know. We had uh, whoever our contract carrier was. We didn't have those little things in our ears that we could talk to each other around the world because half the time our cell phones didn't work. So it was, uh, and we didn't have, certainly didn't have the lady that solved everything for us back at headquarters. So yeah, that would be nice. What, yeah. What, oh what, yeah. What yeah. But. Uh, no, yeah, it's, uh, and I, you know, I, I, part of my, uh, part of my uh, podcast, and is to talk about uh, true crime versus uh, crime fiction, and you know, it, we laugh at uh, you know some of the things that are done 
on uh, TV and, and, and in books. But it's all it's all good in a sense. It, you know, it's entertainment. And, um, you know, as, as long as it doesn't hurt uh, the investigations later on when they get to court, which sometimes you, know, you see happen because people expect uh, yeah. things from law enforcement that only happen on TV. That's right. But otherwise, otherwise, it's good and it's entertainment and it certainly makes the FBI and other law enforcement agencies uh, in most cases, look uh, look really good. It really does, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the uh, the Ghana police now is uh, is head and shoulders above where they were before, and uh, you know they know how to do a homicide investigation. They know what's needed, and uh, they're up on the, the latest lab stuff. And again, uh, as National Academy members, uh, they can rely on the FBI laboratory uh, to help out with cases. Uh, so it's uh, it was all good. It's a uh, good case. And uh, Mr. Kwan's, I don't know how much longer he'll be with us, but uh, uh, one of the thing, one of the other things that our unit would do was uh, was routinely go out and interview serial killers um, just to, uh, you know, find out what we could about them, uh, going in with the knowledge that uh, these people are, you know, manipulators. They're, they're going to lie to you. So you get you go in with both eyes open, but you hope uh, hope you get something from them. And uh, and what did he tell you? I mean, what? I mean, there's no justification for killing thirty or possibly forty women. But no. what did he tell you was the, the reason behind? Uh, he stuck with the spirits. Did the spirits made him do it? Spirits told him <laughs> to do it. So uh, that's the old in the U.S. The devil made me yeah, do it. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Yep, and. Uh, you know, religion uh, over there is, is is very important to the people. So, uh, uh, you know, a lot of them uh, probably believe that, uh, you know, he did. He was talking to the devil or something. But uh, like I said, when when he came up with that, we looked at each other, big smile on our faces because it's like, OK, we got you now, you know. Because you really don't care at that point why he did it. You just want him to start talking about the case exactly. so that you can. Yep. A confession, whatever the reason why you're confessing, is, is, is still good. Yeah, and we, st- and we still need some of the facts, too, to, to make it clear to ourselves, if nothing else, that, uh, yeah, he, he actually did do this murder. You know, he's not just confessing because you get a lot of false confessions as well. People just trying to be famous. So... I would like to, we do have just a, a, a little bit of time. Um, is there a case in, when you were assigned to Vancouver that involved any type of uh, child kidnapping or serial killers that you'd like to, to, to quickly talk to us about? Um, yeah, well, like I said, when, uh, when you're in a legal attache position, uh, you don't, you don't have jurisdiction to actually investigate cases, but uh, we did have one case up there where a 12-year-old girl was uh, recovered, a uh, kidnapping victim, a parental kidnapping victim. Her mother took her uh, from South Dakota back in 2006. The uh, television show America's Most Wanted basically profiled it, and somebody from Dawson Creek, uh, Dawson Creek, uh, British Columbia, called, and uh, I think it was 2008 said that, uh, you know, the girl was in Dawson Creek and the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, responded. Um, we coordinated with them and uh, they determined uh, that the little girl was actually there. So they went in and they uh, took custody of her, took custody of the uh, mother and her boyfriend. And uh, we went up and uh, arranged uh, for the little girl's father who uh, had custody of the little girl to uh, he was going to fly up there and uh, pick her up so uh, there was a lot of border issues a lot of uh, customs issues we had to deal with uh, we got all those resolved and uh, girls reunited with her dad and we got back to uh, south dakota so uh, mom and dad mom and the boyfriend were both uh, extradited to the united states and uh, tried uh, for parental kidnapping in uh, South Dakota. So it was uh, just one type of case. I mean, we couldn't do any actual investigation, but uh, uh, it's not like we solved that case. I mean, America's Most Wanted was, uh, was the key to that case. But uh, it, it kind of highlights how we, uh, we would work with the RCMP, with the uh, local 
officials. Uh, it, it was interesting in that you had such a, a vast territory to cover, um, the Northwest Territory of uh, Canada. Is uh, it's an amazing place. Uh, I how many square miles is that? Do you have I any have idea? I have no idea. It's it's the size of half of the United States. So now, who else was with you in the Vancouver? Nobody. I, I was. Oh, so you were it. I, I was a one man band. It was myself and uh, I had a, a league uh, league at office assistant who uh, you know basically man the office when I wasn't there. She would uh, take all the phone calls and. Handle all the routine stuff, but uh, and how long were you in Vancouver? Uh, three years. It was uh, from 2006 to 2009. Uh, big part of my time was uh, doing a preparation uh, with the RCMP for the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver. Oh. Okay. So uh, we got uh, got to work uh, on a lot of that. Uh, we had uh, we brought the RCMP back to Quantico. Uh, they did a lot of te- tactical exercises there with the hostage rescue team. Uh, they had uh, the special events uh, folks from uh, FBI headquarters helped out, and it was uh, it was a good liaison uh, function. Uh, and the 2010 Olympics went off without a hitch, so I guess it was successful. I guess it was with uh, help from you. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I had the op- opportunity to stay uh, stay through 2010 for the Olympics. But uh, I had been through the uh, Olympics in Salt Lake City, and I thought, okay, I don't need to do that again. So uh, I opted to retire when uh, after three years. So. Up- so when did you actually retire? Uh, July 31st, 2009. And what have you been doing since then? Uh, I've been uh, kind of a consultant. I, uh, I've worked uh, with uh, former director Louis Free and his group, the Free Group. Uh, in 2000, uh, shortly after retiring, I ended up back in Africa. I went to Nigeria with the Free Group for the uh, Under-17 World Cup uh, soccer games and we uh, provided security for that for about a month. And uh, that was an interesting uh interesting time also and then in what way uh just uh setting up uh venues of you know 50 60 thousand people uh and making sure that, that there was no problems uh in this case we were dealing with the nigerian national police and uh we were there for a month and uh they went off without a hitch as well so that was a good thing excellent excellent and then i did the uh penn state case so I got a. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, de- definitely, I know Louis Free investigated the the Sandusky case. Yeah. Yeah. And so you were um, you had a role in that too. Yeah, our role was basically to find out uh, who at the uh, the university knew what was going on with Sandusky and why it wasn't dealt with. You know. Well, it's been there's been a lot of criticism, um, whether deserved or not. Um, about that investigation, do you have any comment on that? Or <laughs> um, n- not really, other than just to say, you know, our job was to uh, to identify who knew what when. We did that. We we gave them a report on that, and uh, caused a lot of people a lot of heartburn. But uh, you know, it's we reported the facts as we found them, and uh, a lot of that was in emails. I mean, we went through th- thousands and thousands of emails and. Uh, that's uh, that's where a lot of the information came from. So, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's still ongoing. Uh, there's a lot of lawsuits been filed in it, so uh, there's not too much we uh, we can really say about that. Uh, I can imagine. So, are you still working with uh, Louis Free's group? Uh, and, and on and off, I do uh, I do some compliance investigations with them. I was down in New Orleans. Uh, for about a year and a half on the uh, BP oil spill case, uh, uh, Louis was named the uh, special master by the federal court in New Orleans to oversee the uh, fraudulent claims filed in that case. So we had a whole team down there that uh, reviewed uh, thousands and thousands of claims filed. And uh, uh, that was that was something to see, too, what uh, some of these people would claim was just unbelievable. You know, there was a lot of people in New Orleans that... Uh, 
that never held a fishing pole in their life, but claim to have lost a lot of money uh, through the fishing industry. So, but uh, that certainly keeps fraud investigators very busy down there. That does. That it does. So, uh, and I do some work with a company called Kinsale, which is uh, operated by another uh, retired FBI uh, executive, Kathleen McChesney, uh, and that deals with the. Uh, Catholic Church problems. So I uh, okay. work on uh, some of the priest cases with her and uh, also work with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children on missing kid cases still and do some work for the State Department. So I'm busy as I want to be. Well, Jerry, it has been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Your career covers so many areas. Um, and uh, you've had a wonderful experience with the FBI. I really did, yeah. Like I said, I wouldn't change a thing, thing about it. And that's the end of the show. There's a picture of the serial killer, Charles Kwanzaa, on my website, jerrywilliams.com. I think the most frightening thing about the story is the fact that he doesn't look like a serial killer. I wish all serial killers looked like Freddy Krueger. That certainly would make it uh, easier and safer for us all. I want to mention two more things before you go. First of all, I'm loving the emails. I'm getting lots of emails. I respond to every last one of them. One of my favorite ones I got this week was from Mark in Kentucky, a college student who told me how much he wants to become an FBI agent. Mark, you really made my day. This is why I'm doing this podcast, to let people know about the FBI, to give them the real information, you know, I write fiction, um, I love movies, I love books, I love TV shows, but sometimes the cases that uh, they show the FBI working on are kind of sensationalized, and I just want to make sure people know exactly how hard and difficult these investigations can be sometimes. And talking about crime fiction and TV shows, I have got to recommend The Family on ABC. It's a new show that's come out. It's about a boy that had been kidnapped that is returned to the family 10 years later. It's a great show. There's so many twists and turns and surprising reveals. I'm telling you, the last episode, I actually gasped at the end when they revealed something that was so shocking and surprising, but plausible and believable. So if you haven't been watching the show, I recommend it. Don't cheat. Go back to the very first episode because you don't want to miss all of the twists and turns. So that is it for today. I just want to remind you that FBI Retired Case File Review is sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again next week for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.